Please, congregation, turn your Bibles this afternoon to Genesis chapter 1 in connection with our ongoing study of the doctrine set forth in the Belgian Confession. We come this afternoon to the doctrine of creation, and what better place to turn than to the great account of creation in Genesis chapter 1. Read Genesis chapter 1 through verse 3 of chapter 2. This is God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and Fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, according, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and, every, and to every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, 
and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The grass withers and the flower fades, but this word of our God endures forever. Now turn also in the back of our Forms and Prayers books to Article 12 of our Confession of Faith, page 164. 164, Article 12, the creation of all things. You'll notice that Article 12 contains six main paragraphs or sections But this afternoon, I'd like for us to consider just the first three of them, which deal specifically with the creation of the world. And then, Lord willing, in the coming weeks, we'll return to the article to consider the existence of angels as well as the demons. We believe that the Father created heaven and earth and all other creatures from nothing when it seemed good to Him by His Word, that is to say, by His Son. He has given all creatures their being, form, and appearance, and their various functions for serving their Creator. Even now, He sustains and governs them all according to His eternal providence and by His infinite power, that they may serve man, in order that man may serve God. This the Church of Christ does confess and believe throughout the world. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the psalm that we sang just a few moments ago raises what is one of the most important questions that can be raised on this side of glory. And the question is this, if the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And if you paid attention to the words of that psalm, to Psalm 11, then perhaps you noticed that, that two answers were given. The first answer seems to have come from David's counselors. What should the righteous do when the foundations are destroyed? According to David's counselors, the righteous should flee. They should run away and not look back. They should flee like a bird to the mountains far away. For the godless take aim with their bow and their dart. Like snipers they shoot at the upright in heart. What should the righteous do when the foundations are destroyed? They should run away. That's the first offered solution. Before we consider the the second solution, the the correct solution, we have to recognize that it is indeed our great temptation this afternoon to to embrace this first solution as our own. For we too look at the world around us and, and we see what David sees, that the foundations are being destroyed. All around us, we, we see how the world's denial of God and defiance against God has only introduced greater degrees of of chaos and confusion into our society. Indeed, the the foundations, it would seem, are being destroyed. We now live in a world that says men can be women and that women can be men. And we now live in a world, in a society, in which same-sex unions have become so normalized and praised, you can hardly turn on the TV without being confronted with some openly gay couple that's being praised by by all those around him or her. And these divergent views on gender and human sexuality are, of course, simply part for the whole. Because all this confusion that now surrounds gender and human sexuality is simply the the fruit of of previous attacks on the foundations. Those long-standing attacks of of secularism and feminism, those long-standing attacks on the foundation, such as relativism and pragmatism and, and materialism. And all of these are, of course, different, just different expressions of, of the primary attack on the foundation, which is the world's rejection and denial of God the Creator. And the temptation that we face as, as the little church living in in the big world is either to to retreat, to simply flee like a bird to a mountain far away, to to stop engaging altogether, or to simply give in, to to buckle under the pressure so that we begin to look and sound just like the world, which many churches of our day have sadly already done. And so much so that they become nothing but, but empty shells of their former selves. We know that when 
A church parts ways with the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord parts ways with the church. And the glorious Christ, Revelation 3, spits out that church out of his mouth. But how does David respond to the solution proposed to him by his counselors? He says, the Lord is my refuge. How then can you say, oh, flee like a bird to your mountain away? Be sure that the Lord in his temple on high, in heaven enthroned over man, casts his eye. When the foundations are being destroyed, David tells us that rather than than shrinking back or, or simply giving in, The righteous lift up their eyes to the Lord who sits enthroned in the heavens. The righteous remember that their help is indeed in the name of the Lord who made the heavens, who made the earth. When the foundations are being destroyed, the righteous live in light of the words that they sing. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. And keeping this truth always in mind is really what lies at at the very heart of Article 12 of our confession, that that the God who created all things continues even now to, to sustain and govern all things by His eternal providence and infinite power. And so as we seek to, to work our way through this first half of this article of our confession, I'd like for us to consider three things together, noticing, first of all, creation's glorious origin, and then secondly, creation's good order. And then finally, creation's Godward objective. Well, it's only fitting, isn't it, that the Bible, which is a book that's all about God, should therefore begin with God in the way that it does. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This, boys and girls, is indeed the starting point of the Christian religion. In the beginning, God created the heavens in the earth. But as one pastor has suggested, this statement is so simple on the one hand that it might be rather easy for us to to miss just how radical it is on the other hand. For when this statement was originally written, it no doubt must have stood out for its simplicity, but not only that, but also for its radical stand against every other ideology and every other human invention that described why this world came to be and how this world came to be. You see, if we really want to understand the the content and the comfort of this foundational truth of Genesis 1 verse 1, all right, then we need to, to hear these opening words as they were heard for the first time by the people of Israel. As I trust most of you already know, the first five books of the Bible were were written by God's servant Moses after the Lord had had accomplished that great work of redemption, bringing Israel out of that land of Egypt, out of that house of slavery. And now after 400 years of living in that pagan society, and after 400 years of being totally inundated and and submersed in all the pagan idols and and ideologies of that society. After after 400 years of, of confusion, Moses, inspired by the Spirit of God, now takes the people of God all the way back to the very beginning. And he says, in the beginning, God. Not not Pharaoh, whom the Egyptians believed to be a god. Not the sun or the moon or the stars, whom the Egyptians believed to be a god. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God, this God who created, we need to remember, is speaking here in Genesis chapter 1, not only as as creator, but he's also speaking to Israel, also as as redeemer. He's speaking to them as, as the glorious God of grace, who likewise spoke by Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 43, verse 1, saying, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. And I have called you by name, and you are mine. In Genesis 1, God is, is speaking to the people of Israel, and He's speaking to us. He as he spoke by Isaiah in chapter 44, verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. Who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who made all things. 
who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. In other words, from the very outset of the Bible, God is is coming to us and he's saying, in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. Therefore, you as creatures must learn to to look to me and, and to me alone as your creator. From the very outset of the Bible, the Spirit is is calling all men everywhere to behold the one true God of the universe. And from the very outset, he is, the Spirit is, is drawing this line of, of demarcation, this distinction between the, the creature and, and the creator. For the affirmation of this distinction, writes Herman Bovink, is where true religion must begin. For whenever man fails to make this proper distinction, he will always find himself worshiping the creature rather than the Creator, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1. And so Ian Hamilton says it quite well when he says that Genesis chapter 1 is therefore not only where the Bible begins, but it is also the very foundation upon which the entirety of the Bible rests. We all know that the most important part of any building is its, is its foundation. If a building, no matter how Beautiful it may be on the outside. If that building has a poor foundation, then it's simply a disaster waiting to happen. But thanks be to God that the message of the gospel that we proclaim rests upon a sure foundation that can never be destroyed in the end. And that the whole edifice of the word of God rests all its way on this first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In this opening chapter, we discover why the world is here rather than not here. Here we discover who we are and why we're here rather than being not here. And here in this opening chapter, in this opening verse, we're confronted with the glorious majesty of God, who of His own goodness and grace created heaven and earth and all creatures from nothing when it seemed good to Him by His word, that is to say, by His Son. Out of nothing, ex nihilo, God spoke the world into existence. It's not as though God took something that was already there and then rearranged things and formed things. That, of course, is the nature of our little lowercase creations. We don't call anything forth out from nothing, but we simply build with what God has given us to build with. We, we build, we craft, we sculpt, but, but not God. God created the world out of nothing. Spoke it into being. And although we can't begin to comprehend what that even is, how can something come out of, out of nothing, out of no thing? By faith, as the author of Hebrews, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Hebrews 11, verse 3. In Genesis chapter 1, we're confronted with creation's glorious origin. In this, we discover congregation is truly the, the great need of our world today, just as it was the, the great need for the people of Israel back in the days of Moses. Our world stands in in desperate need of being reacquainted with its creator. Our world today, like the people of Israel, stands in desperate need of being transformed by the renewal of their minds. And to bring about that renewal of the mind, to to confront all those pagan ideologies of Egypt, Moses describes creation's glorious origin. In the beginning, it was God who made the heavens and the earth. And this Moses does not only to to repudiate the ideologies of Egypt and of the world, but also he he does that Israel might might rest in the comfort of of being created by this God who knows them. He is seeking to press upon the people of Israel that that Israel can rest in reality, that their destiny is not left up to the false and fickle gods of Egypt, but that rather they might see that their destiny is held by the hand of the one true God of the universe. Congregation, herein lies our own comfort tonight. Herein we find the answer and the solution to 
to the world's greatest need, which is to be reacquainted with the triune God who makes, who made the heavens and the earth. Here in Genesis chapter 1, the lie of atheism is exposed for the folly that it really is. As the psalmist says in Psalm 14, it is only the fool who says in his heart, there is no God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. With these opening words, says John Calvin, it is as if God were enlightening us to draw us to himself and to make us aware that he is the fountain and origin of all things, that everything depends on him, and to make us aware that everything is founded and sustained by his power. Hence, the world from its heights to its depths is like a mirror to compel us to contemplate God. In other words, Genesis chapter 1 is simply saying, behold your God. Behold your God. Look, look to Him and, and lean upon Him, for He is your maker and He is your, your only helper when, when the foundations appear to be being destroyed. For He's not some impersonal or, or ambivalent God like the false gods of Egypt. But he is the one true God, the personal God who can be known. And this we discover is who God has been from all eternity. From all eternity, God was known within himself as the Father and the Son and Spirit dwelt together in, in perfect unity and in eternal communion with each other. And we see that communion expressed here in the opening chapter of the Bible as the three persons come and they, and they reason together saying, let us make man in our image. And the wonder, congregation, of God's word this evening is that when God created, his intention was to draw us into that communion so he might be known not only within himself but also by, by us. No, he might be known by him. Creation has its glorious origin in this personal God, the triune God, who has granted us to know him so intimately that we can say, this is my Father's world. For the whole world is his. He is the one who spoke it into being, and he is the one who, who ordered all things in such a marvelous way that he himself could could look over all that he had made and say, it was very good. We hear that refrain so clearly, and it was good, and it was, it was very good. Out of the, the disorder of, of the world being without form and void, the spirit of order as he hovered over the surface of the waters brought the world to order. In verse 2 we find that the world was empty, formless, and dark. But into the darkness of the abyss, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then he, he formed the world, separating what needed to be separated and, and filling, it, filling it with what it needed to be filled with so that it could become a, a place that was habitable and, and hospitable for us. And everything we discover was done in an orderly way. Perhaps you you notice something, somewhat of, of a pattern, the five common elements that seem to be found in almost each of these days. With each passing day, we see that, that God speaks His created word, let there be. And then secondly, we say that word is, is fulfilled, and it was so. And then thirdly, God names it. He calls the sky, sky, and, and the land, land. And then fourthly, God gives His assessment. He says, and it was good. And then finally read the repeated phrase that there was evening and there was morning. And perhaps you also took note of the, of the symmetry with regards to how days 1, 2, and 3 correspond to days 4, 5, and 6. In the first three days, we see God forming, the, 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 the place to ha forming a place to, to habitat. And then we see Him filling that habitat in days 4 through 6. Day 1 corresponds to day four. On day one, God separated the light from the darkness, and then on day four, he, he filled the light and the darkness with, with the illuminaries, the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
The ceremony day two corresponds to day five. On day two, God separated the, the waters above from the waters below. And then on day five, he, he fills the sky above with the birds of the air and then the ocean below with the fish of the sea. And so also day three corresponds to day six. On day three, God forms the dry land. And then on day six, he, he fills the land with, with animals and ultimately with people. Our God is a God of order. And he has embedded good order with, within the creation. As Paul says, our God is not a God of confusion, but he's a God of peace. And that we might reflect that orderly way of God. What does Paul say? He says to the church in Corinth, let all things be done decently and in good order because our God is a God of order. Not of confusion and chaos, but a God of order and where, wherein all things cohere. Well, I'm not, and while I'm not going to belabor the point this evening, I see no good reason for why we'd imagine that these days are anything less than normal days as we know them. For not only is each day concluded with the phrase, and there was evening and there was morning, but the creation itself is, is giving us an orderly pattern for our lives today. This, this pattern that we know very, very well of seven, of, of working six days and, and resting the seventh day as God highlights in Exodus chapter 20, the fourth commandment. And so we confess in Article 12 our confession that our God is indeed an orderly God. That he has given all creatures their being, form, and appearance, and their various functions for serving their creator. And in order that all these creatures might be of service to God's glory, he made man to be the crown of creation, saying, let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. And if you haven't already had the chance to peruse your copy of the New Reformation Catechism on Human Sexuality, you may want to take a special look at that catechism especially that, that drives these points home where, where Reverend Gordon, especially in questions 5 and 6, sets forth the, the scriptural teaching that in making us Male and female, God established a natural order in the creation that is good for us as his image bearers. He didn't create this endless number of genders. His design wasn't for all the chaos and confusion and heartbreak and depression and suicides that, that stem forth from that confusion and chaos. But in an orderly way, he made the man and the woman together. They might image God together in their respective roles assigned to them by their maker. And so our confession takes a strong stand against all other theories as to the creation of the world and certainly against the, the theory of evolution that says men came from monkeys who, who came from fish because as Genesis 1 teaches us, God makes each creature according to to its kind, and he gives them their functions and their appearance, nor that they might, nor that we might sing, This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. We look at the world around us and we see that he speaks to us everywhere. We see his order written over the face of the earth. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim his handiwork, says Psalm 19. Psalm 104 says, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Everywhere in the universe, says one theologian, we see displayed a marvelous order and fitness, proclaiming the unending power and wisdom of our God. Not only have all things received their existence by God, but likewise their shapes and forms. Thus we behold both a remarkable unity within and almost, and with it an almost infinite variety. And so we discover here in Genesis 1 and here in our confession that everything and everyone has been given a unique purpose by God himself. That God didn't make any mistakes. He didn't 
make anything to be of, of no use, but rather he carefully ordered all things in such a way to serve man that man might serve God. But when this good order is denied, what happens? When this good order of God's creation is designed, everything begins to unravel, doesn't it? And this, of course, is why our world is the way that, that it is. When Genesis 1 is thrown out the window, everything begins to spiral and devolve into chaos and confusion. And the only thing that can, that can right the ship is for the world and for our society to to repent and look once more to the Creator and, and to seek counsel from, from the Word of the Creator to discover how He would, would have things to be in this world. For the only reason why this chaos has not yet consumed the world is because even now our God continues to sustain and govern all things according to His eternal providence and infinite power as our confession says. Contrary to the idea that God perhaps created the world and then, and then left the world like some clockmaker who makes a clock and then just leaves it to, to let the gears turn. The Word of God in our confession teaches us that God continues to sustain the world and, and uphold the world by His providential power. He didn't leave the world or abandon the world, but He continues to invest Himself in the world. The psalmist in Psalm 104 extols him for this very thing, saying, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and, and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man. All creatures look to you, and you give them food in their due season. Genesis 1, you could say, is portraying God as the, the king of the universe. He he owns it and He directs it. God Himself is the, the law of the land. And nothing happens apart from His will. For all things came into existence by His will and all things are carried out according to His will. And we need to believe that this afternoon. The people of Israel need to believe that too. She needed to believe that her destiny wasn't held by the stars of the sky as the Egyptians said but by the God of the universe. And so if we were to summarize everything that's been said so far, what God is, is saying to us here in Genesis 1 is, you were made by me and for me. You were made by me and for me. And that's what we want to consider in the last place this evening, creation's God word objective Commenting on this article of our confession, P.Y. DeYoung writes that as soon as man truly begins to reflect on life, he discovers that the things of the world can never satisfy the deepest needs of his heart. For the older man gets, the more disappointments he endures. And so P.Y. DeYoung gets it exactly right when he goes on to say, only the Christian gospel gives the right view of the world. It does not seek to compete with science in answering all the riddles of life, but its aim is rather to provide a life and worldview in the light of which all our activities and aspirations can be properly evaluated. And at the foundation of this life and, and worldview is the reality that we were made by God and for God. As the apostle says in Colossians chapter 1, all things were created through Him and for Him. Or to borrow the words of St. Augustine, God made us for, our, for Himself. And so our hearts are restless until they find rest in Him. And this, isn't this what we also find in Lord's Day 3 of our catechism, that God made man in His own image and goodness and righteousness and holiness. And why? So that He might truly know God, His Creator, love Him with all His heart and live with Him in eternal happiness and glory. Or to quote the Westminster Confession, this is the, the chief end of man to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And this congregation is the, the God word, the unto God objective that, that Genesis 1 places before us. God didn't create the world because He was lonely or because He, he felt like He had to, but, but because 
he wanted to, in order that he might be glorified, in order that we ourselves might, might share in that glory by reflecting his glory as his image bearers. And this Gobbert objective, of course, is also in part what the, the institution of the Sabbath was always meant to highlight. That as Israel came out of Egypt, that, that land of slavery, that nation of, of workaholics, make bricks without straw, God was saying, you will not do as the nations do, but rather on, on the seventh day you shall rest from all your work. On the Sabbath day you shall remember why you were placed on the earth, namely to bring glory to me. And you shall remember how I saved you and, and brought you out of the house of slavery that you might do that very thing, that you might worship me here in the wilderness. How much more shouldn't this be the case now as we find rest in the Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of Sabbath rest? Every one of us we see in Christ and by His Word has been made by God and for God. Every one of us here has a purpose. None of our lives are without meaning or significance. All of our lives matter. God himself has placed you where you are, and he calls you to, to bloom where you're planted. He calls you to, to live for his praise and honor, to show forth in your own life something of, of the beauty of his goodness and grace. When the psalmist in Psalm 104 considers that the works of God's hands and in creation and providence, how does he respond? He, he cries out, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. I will sing to the Lord as, as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Congregation, how can we not give him our everything when we consider the fact that God has not only created us, but also redeemed us. When the foundations are being destroyed, what reason have we to feel like we can only either shrink back or, or give in? What reason has the, has the church to, to abandon science and the study of the world when she remembers who she is in Christ? The church has no reason to do that. When she anchors herself in, in the plain truth of the Word of God, Psalm 115 says, The heavens are God since time began, but he has given the earth to man. The dead praise not the living God, but we will sound his praise abroad. Yea, we will ever bless his name. O oh, praise the Lord, his praise proclaim. For a day is indeed coming and is in fact coming very soon. We shall join the saints who have gone into glory before us and we shall... Sing together with them, worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We can look to the Lord who sits enthroned in the heavens. And we can look to the Lord who has promised from that throne, behold, I am making all things new, and I am coming very soon. This is our Father's world. And no, the battle is not done, but Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and heaven and earth will be made one. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, our Creator and Lord. We come before you again as finite creatures, recognizing that we were made by your hand from the dust of the ground and that you are therefore 
able and righteous to lay claim on our lives and to remind us that we were created by you and for you. Father, we live in a world in which the foundations are being destroyed. And now our temptation is to shrink back, to flee like a bird to a mountain away. But Father, in the midst of the insanity and confusion of the world and our society, give us boldness to speak the truth plainly to our neighbors, to our friends, to our coworkers. May we remember, Lord, that only the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so, Father, as we engage ourselves with the fools of the world, may we have great pity for them and compassion for them. For they do not know the meaning of life. And they must live their lives having no sense of real purpose, for they live in rebellion against their Creator. Father, we pray that you would reacquaint them with yourself that you would reveal yourself powerfully to them through the creation that you have made and through the word that you have written, that indeed the ends of all the earth should hear and come unto the Lord in fear. This we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.